Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jason Vandiver. I'm Energy Code Program Manager for SPEAR. Uh, most of you on the webinar this morning know SPEAR. Uh, for those of you that don't, we're a regional energy efficiency organization covering Texas and Oklahoma. Um, one of the things that I do for SPEAR is help code officials, contractors, other stakeholders in Texas and Oklahoma uh, better understand the energy code, uh, basically so buildings can get built more efficiently and save energy. Uh, for the code officials on the webinar this morning, uh, there's some ways that I'd be happy to help you guys out. Uh, field training of your inspectors and or plan reviewers. Um, the field training, I really think, does more good than anything. Uh, when you, you really residentially uh, getting out there on a, on a framing, uh, at the framing stage on a house and really looking at blocking and air sealing details, uh, corresponding the energy code uh, submittals with what we're seeing in the field. Um, and ultimately, I always learn a few things and the inspectors do too. Uh, and the, the great thing about uh, helping you out uh, as, far, as far as doing that, the price is right, it's free. Uh, I'm happy to help you guys out any way I can. Uh, and of course, any, any energy code questions or comments, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, happy to, to answer those as well. Um, I've been doing a lot of two hour, it's basically a residential HVAC presentation for HVAC contractors. I've done about 30 of them or so in the last year. And, you know, just basically manual JS and D. And, and I spent about the first half of the presentation really uh, focusing on the exact right way to do it. And then we kind of take a step back and it's like, okay, well, if you're not requiring JS and D, at the jurisdiction and you're just allowing people to use rules of thumb and best practices, well, let's look at some, some, some things to look at along those lines, just kind of living in that reality that you can't build a doghouse to code. You darn sure can't build a house to code. So if, if, if we're not dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, you know, maybe what are some flex duck best practices, some ways, you know, just some, some general best practices and some, some do's and don'ts in residential HVAC installation. And uh, th this picture here that you see in front of you uh, is on one of my slides. And uh, ACA actually has a manual uh, uh, that gives you some zoning guidance, uh, manual ZR, um, but one of the attend one of the HVAC technicians in the class started asking questions about zoning, and I remember the first time I did I was doing a CO inspection when I was a building official, and I crawled up into an attic and saw a duct running from the uh, return plenum to the supply plenum, and I'm looking at this duct and I'm thinking, was this HVAC installer on drugs? What in the world is going on? So you know, call the HVAC contractor. And I just frankly didn't have the knowledge to question the way he did the install. Uh, so, you know, I, I basically didn't have time to thoroughly review the manufacturer's documentation. So I, I just believed what he was telling me and moved on down the road. Well, in showing this picture, some questions were coming up and one of the attendees in one of my classes said, oh, I saw a great presentation and gave me David uh, Emig's contact information. And uh, so I'm really excited to have uh, David with us this morning. Uh, he's going to be talking about forced air zoning bypass 101. And so I, I know there's a lot of questions out there. Uh, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping before we get started. Uh, typically, we will take all questions at the end. Um, if uh, if you, there's a Q&A, panel down there, just type in your question and we'll ask those of David David at the end. Um, and then uh, he, he does have his contact information on his first slide. Um, so I'm, 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 he'd be happy to answer those as well. Uh, anyway, with that, uh, David uh, Emig with EWC Controls has been with them almost 20 years, covers everywhere from Texas to California to Montana. Um, and he really knows Forced air zoning bypass, so I can't think of a better person to give the webinar for us. Uh, remember, for your ICCCUs, you will get a course evaluation after this. 
Uh, we'll send a copy of the uh, a PDF of the PowerPoint. So you will get a PDF of the PowerPoint with a course evaluation. Uh, just fill out that course evaluation and that will get you your ICC CEUs. Uh, with that, let me unmute David. And David, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and we will get you started. Unmute. All righty. All right. Thank you, Jason. And I think you're still sharing to where I can't get on there yet. Okay. Let's see here. You don't have the share icon anymore? I, I have. Uh, I have a share icon down here, but then it comes up. You cannot start screen sharing while the other participant is sharing. Okay. I paused my share. So, or let me stop my share. All right. I stopped my there share. Now, see if you can. There we go. Oh, that's new. I haven't come across that before. All right. It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Jason, and I uh, want to thank everybody for tuning in here this morning. If at any time, like Jason said, if you do have a question regarding something we're going over, uh, something that's popped into your head, or something that you may have ran, uh, ran into while you're out, you've been out in the field, by all means, you can ask it uh, during the Q&A period. Otherwise, we will plow through this. And uh, again, I really do appreciate you inviting me on. The first screen, you bet my contact information. It has a couple of emails on there as well as my cell phone. I answer my cell phone. I do not like talking to voicemails, nor do I expect anybody else to. So please give me a call. Uh, with that being said, I do cover from Texas up to South Dakota, out to California. I do quite a bit of traveling and there are times where I'm on a plane and I obviously cannot answer my phone uh, or while I'm doing a presentation, but please email me, leave a message and I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. We'll go through a couple of basic uh, forest air zoning, some applications and uh, the biggest portion of this presentation this morning will be on the bypass and it's actually one of my favorites for the fact uh, I don't want to say we feel like we do it the best or I should say uh, we've screwed up so many times in the last 55 years of doing zoning that we now know the best practice out there to install zoning and uh, again if you have questions by all means ask them. EWC start off a little bit about us we're the one of the oldest manufacturers. We have been business since 1961, the majority of it doing power transformers for the military. Been in the stealth fighter, the Apache helicopters, Abrams tanks, uh, Hellfire missile. We also had products on the space shuttles. We've since sold that division off and in 1988 became just a sole manufacturer of forced air zoning. Uh, does this mean my product is military grade? No. Uh, however, some of the characteristics that our engineers put into our transformer division, we were able to incorporate into our zoning panels. Uh, EWC here in the last, oh, well, let's go with the last nine, 10 years, we've kind of taken a path to align ourselves with the larger manufacturers out there. We, the ICP Carrier Corporation, we build dampers for their Infinity, the Bryant Evolution Zone System, your Ingersoll Rand Company, the Train American Standard Group, we build the dampers that uh, work on their communicating zone system your Ream and Rood manufacturer, we build their zoning panel as well as the dampers for their communicating zone system. And then the Daikin Corporation, we build the panel. And yes, with that panel, you can use a couple of different options on dampers, but we do prefer that Daikin dealers use our dampers on that system. 
our damper itself, it kind of sets us apart from the majority of zoning manufacturers out there. The first thing that we do is we use a Blemo actuator on our damper. And this Blemo actuator is a 35 second uh, power open and power close. We like the power open, power close for the fact that our variable speed blowers deal with back pressure or resistance against that blower wheel, and that's how it throws its designed CFM. Well, when you're using a lot of spring actuated dampers, they have two timing sequences. You have a power close on the majority of them, about 15 seconds, but then a power, a spring open, which a lot of them will go anywhere between one and a half to four seconds for them to fly open. Well, if you had a three zone system on a variable speed blower and you have one zone calling and the other two zones are closed, now during that call, a, another zone calls, well, that damper flies open, the static in the plenum drops, your variable speed blower says, what the heck is going on? And it starts to ramp up and it doesn't ramp to, oh, okay, here's my static it's built into the algorithm of those heads that that motor will ramp up and down for 30 seconds. Well, by us using that power open, power close of 35 seconds, it is nice, slow to open up and slow to go closed, making sure that variable speed motors don't hunt. We also have, instead of a gasket on the inside, you see, we just have a pour-on cellular foam that's crushed between two plates of metal. One of the biggest problems in our industry is restriction and ductwork. Well, my competitors have a damper that have about a half-inch gasket on the side. Well, if you take an eight-inch damper and you put a half-inch gasket all the way around, you've now knocked that damper down to seven inches. We give you 100% airflow with this damper. We also have nylon shafts on the inside, keeping the heat transfer inside and outside the ducts reduces our chances of sweating. Uh, for those of you all, if you're in the Houston or high humidity area, well, we've got 130 degrees with 95% humidity in the attic, and we've got sometimes in a zoning application, 45 degrees, 47 degrees running through the ductwork. Well, with a metal shaft, you can see condensation happening as that metal shaft from the inside penetrates through the damper into the actual attic and now you have condensation. Also on our damper, when it does get to the fully open or fully closed position, this cap lights up red when the damper is closed, green when the damper is open, letting the contractor know, hey, my damper is open and closed, cuts his checkout time easy to diagnose systems. We also have two set screws. The one on the right will keep this damper from closing all the way. I'll talk a little bit about bleeding air into particular zones. Uh, I believe uh, in the Houston market, they do not like to have a damper going all the way to the fully closed position. So in the past, rather than taking a oh, a, a set screw and driving it up through the damper to where the blade stops going down. What we have done is Belimo put a stop on this damper. You can loosen the stop up, move it up. Now as this damper travels to the closed position, it'll hit that stop. Since 18 pounds of torque, we drop power to the inside the motor. We keep power to the motor and that's when it'll illuminate that red or green LED. We also have a stop on the other side. This keeps it from opening all the way. Now this is great for applications where if you had too much air going into a particular zone, rather than installing a manual damper collar and sitting there and fidgeting with the airflow, you can simply go up to this damper, take the stop, loosen it up, move it up. Now as this damper travels to the open position, Basically, you're adjusting the airflow on every zone system that you're installing these dampers on. Rectangular dampers, multitude of sizes. Uh, we build them all the way up to 30 by 36. We've done some other custom sizes as well. 
We also have a slip-in damper, not used too much here in the Texas, Oklahoma market, but you get up into the Midwest where a lot of hard pipe is ran. This is a beautiful damper rather than trying to cut a perfect section out of metal pipe. Simply take a one inch drill bit, drill a hole, take your 10 snips. If it's a eight inch pipe, go four inches off the hole one way, four inches the other way, slide the damper in, zip, 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 you know, have a damper on that existing metal pipe. Uh, something that we can do that nobody else in the industry can do. Uh, this particular damper only draws one and a half VA. So we can take up to five dampers, wire them, you want to call it the daisy chained wiring, wire from damper to damper to damper to damper to damper back to the panel. I'll open and close up to five dampers with no additional relays. Now our panels are capable of accepting three wires into each one of the terminal blocks, which literally gives us the ability to go out five dampers back to the panel, five more dampers back to the panel, five more dampers back to the same terminal block. Heck, I'll open and close 15 dampers with no additional relays. Now, this is perfect for the retrofit market that we have. We have guys going into attics and our duct work is a spider system. We've all seen it. It's your supply plenum and there's, oh, let's go with 11, flex runs coming off of that six foot plenum going everywhere around a house. Well, rather than doing a bunch of funky duct work to knock it down to one or two or three dampers, a guy could actually go in with 11 dampers and tie four or five of them together back to the panel and zone a house out that way. Uh, this kind of slide, I, I love bring it up. Uh, when I'm doing a training class for the fact that we look at the air conditioning industry, where we were, where we are, where we're heading. And uh, I, I love to bring up the fact that our thermostats, where do they sit in a home? The, the majority of our thermostats sit in the middle of a hallway, in the middle of a house. And the biggest thing I like to bring up, in the middle of a hallway, if we think about that, the most comfortable spot in our homes that we build is in the middle of a hallway. Why? We don't live in our hallway. We live in our exterior spaces, whether it's a living room, master bedroom, home offices, game rooms, bonus rooms, whatever you want to call them. That's where we live. So do we really think the future of air conditioning is one thermostat sitting in the middle of a house? And I can, I'll can i guarantee it's not. In fact, uh, EWC, since its inception, has only had one year where we did not beat prior year's sales. And that's around well, 2008 when the whole uh, industry kind of took a bust on the construction side of it. When we look at the, the growth of zoning, homeowners want to be comfortable around their homes. And the biggest way they want to be comfortable uh, in controlling their air conditioning heating system is over their phone or through the internet. And all of our systems we can tie into anybody's Wi Fi thermostat. Like I kind of just said, the biggest benefit from zoning is comfort. No longer are we gonna have that thermostat in the middle of a house. It doesn't sense east sun, west sun. It doesn't sense north wind, south wind. What does it sense? It senses the temperature right there in the hallway. And again, the most comfortable spot in our homes is a hallway. It just doesn't make sense. Now, if I looked at the savings portion of a zone system, uh, a lot of people don't talk about it for the fact that I cannot control a homeowner's thermostat. But if a homeowner uses their zone system properly, heat or cool the bedrooms while they're sleeping, set back to living area, heat or cool their living area while they're up and at them, set back to sleeping area, you can save money on your electric bill. Zoning is great for new construction and big houses. I hear this all the time and I somewhat agree. New construction, it's a whole lot easier to install zoning in the new construction side. You don't have drywall in the way, you don't have insulation in the way, you can run your thermostat wires wherever the heck you want. Big houses, only people in big houses can afford zoning. 
Well, I'm, I'm here to let you know that the zoning is great for the retrofit in a small house market. And this retrofit market is, it's huge. Uh, just for the fact that we can walk into anybody's home and simply ask them a, a generic question. Ma'am, sir, do you have any hot or cold spots around your house? Well, everybody has hot and cold spots around their house. My generation, we just grew up knowing it. Uh, the generation that we have now, people want to have the exact same temperature all around their houses. And the only way that you're able to do that is through zoning. And small houses, I hear this a lot when I'm doing trainings. David, I won't, I won't put a zone system in a house less than 2,000 square feet. Well, why not? Does that guy that's living in a 1,100 square foot, he's got a, a room that he sleeps in and a room that he lives in. That's a two zone system. Saving 20 bucks to somebody in a small house, as far as I'm concerned, is the same as saving $200 to someone in a big house. So out there we have consumers that are definitely demanding forced air zoning. And I, I hear it quite a bit when I'm flying on a plane, I'll sit down and it's pretty tough for me to keep my mouth shut for two hours or however long I'm sitting on a plane. So this person will sit down next to me and I ask them a generic question. I basically, what's your name, what do you do? Well, they tell me their name, they tell me what they do and then of course they ask me. And I say, my name's David Amick. I'm a forced air zoning trainer. They look at me, blank stare, what the heck is forced air zoning? And uh, it's kind of funny because now you have a captive audience. They've got uh, their seatbelt in. They can't get up and move from you uh, however much they want to move because I'll just sit there and continue to talk about forced air zoning to them. I basically tell them, I go into your house. We put multiple thermostats around your house. I can give you the temperatures you want when and where you want them. And the majority of them will say, well, you mean with multiple air conditioners? I go, no, 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 we can do one air conditioner, multiple thermostats. And we usually get into a conversation now about, oh, the tech industry is kind of driving. And I'll say this, the tech industry has definitely helped the air conditioning industry. We're able to do so much more things with our equipment, uh, as well as with this communicating zone systems that we weren't able to do with the single stage equipment that has been prevalent in our industry. Now, if I looked at a typical duct layout, let's say I have a two zone system, I've got 750 CFM heading to the living area, 450 CFM heading to a sleeping area. When I shut off that 750 CFM zone, do I want to push 1200 CFM down that other zone? Of course not, that duct work would be loud as heck. You might as well put your mattress out at the airport because that's what it's gonna sound like. We're going to use a bypass damper. We at EWC Controls, excuse me, we have three bypasses. Our CLBD bypass, it's a constant load bypass that, where a dealer can dial in a static. It'll go from 0.1 up to 0.8 inches of static. We have a window that shows the damper blade what position it's in. We also have an electronic bypass, which is a step up from the CLBD. This bypass has a uh, basically a magnet Hela gauge mounted to the side of the damper that you unscrew the top and then you dial in your static and it also goes from 0.1 up to one inch of static. And the one that I'll talk about a lot today is going to be our SBD damper and this is our smart bypass damper. And you'll see uh, the reason why we called it a smart bypass damper, but this one also has a magnet Hela gauge built right into the motor. Now this bypass, we like to see it go directly into the return. It does some wonderful things with our equipment as well as it will kill a piece of equipment if it is designed improper or sized improper. <clears throat> By it going directly into the return, like I said, it does some beautiful things with the equipment. Multi-stage variable speed with zoning is the ultimate of systems that someone can put inside their home. But if uh, a dealer is going up against someone who is selling variable speed for either dehumidification or airflow purposes only, I'm sorry, but there is no variable speed made today that can dehumidify, nor can it deliver air like a zone system can. And the reason I say that 
on a variable speed system, how does it dehumidify? Well, it, it dehumidifies because we slow the blower down. Okay, well, if we slow the blower down, what did we now do to the static inside our duct? Well, we reduced it. Okay, well, if we reduced our static in the duct, what did we do now to our designed throw out of a gorilla register? Well, we reduced it. Okay, so if we reduced our throw out of that grill, what did we now do to the runtime on the equipment? We increased it. And that's exactly what we tell our homeowners, all right, you've got this new high-speed piece of equipment, uh, your run times are going to increase. And they kind of look at us with a blank stare, they don't know what a run time is, but you'll always have that one homeowner that uh, will call you up after a new install and they'll say, well, David, your, your company put an air conditioner in and uh, I had the stopwatch on the new one and the new one runs longer than the old system. And we look at them and go, well, that's a high efficiency. Well, homeowners don't relate the unit running longer uh, compared to their old unit as high efficiency. We have to explain to them the dehumidification circuit that's going on with our variable speed systems. And then as far as for airflow with a variable speed, uh, you know it and I know it, that air takes the path of least resistance. Well, our houses that have that far bedroom, that's where it can't get its airflow from, we, or it can't get airflow to, we have uh, our variable speeds that were brought out, oh, we can deliver air. Well, we can deliver a nominal CFM up to one inch of static. However, air takes the path of least resistance, and our larger ducts are, are they in the back bedroom or are they in our living areas? Well, they're in the living area and our thermostat is closer to the back bedroom or the living area? What's well, closer to the living area? So that well, the majority of air is going out into that living area, hitting the thermostat satisfying before it gets back to that far bedroom. So again, by installing zoning, I'll be able to take care of both situations, dehumidification as well as deliver the airflow. So as we bring this bypass air back into the return, like I said, it does some beautiful things with our equipment. If I looked in the cooling mode, I'll take cold air, not needed, bring it through the bypass, back into the return. What did I do to the coil temperature? I dropped it. Okay, so if I have dropped air, I am now dehumidifying like there is no tomorrow. Go take a look at your condensate line. It is no longer a drip, drip, drip. It is like someone turned a faucet on. Now, what did I do to the static inside the plenum? All I did was take excess air through the bypass. So even if I am on a variable speed or a two-stage piece of equipment, I have just the excess air going through the bypass. I have maintained static inside the plenum. So if I've maintained static in the plenum, I now have drier, colder air going into the space that's calling, satisfying the thermostat faster. Now we can take it a step further and ask, what did we do to the amp draw on a compressor? Well, we've dropped it. For the fact that it can be 105 degrees outside, the unit comes on, this bypass air going back in across the coil, our suction pressure drops. Our amp draw on the compressor, it doesn't have to work as hard, it can be relieved. You know, I've just increased the efficiency of every HVAC system out there. Uh, one thing that EWC does, we keep a, I'm sorry, we have a supply air sensor that it's packaged with every panel. I wanna make sure that I'm not slugging liquid back to a compressor, freezing up a coil, going into inoperable temperatures. Uh, and I'll even take, and, and again, I'll, I'll look at Houston for the fact, uh, this is where I see the majority of duct sweating situations because of our humidity. Well, We've got uh, uh, one particular company that uh, they'll drop their supply temperature down to 40 degrees. Well, you take 40 degrees through a duct, you put it in that Houston market, I'm sorry, you're going to have not only the duct sweating, the cabinet sweating, you'll have everything sweating. So we have our supply air sensor tied back to the panel. It's fully adjustable from uh, all the way up to 52 degrees. Well, I'm down in the Houston market, 
I'll train down there having those guys set that to where I'm not getting below 50 degrees on that supply plan. I'm making sure that I'm not, I'm going to try and prohibit the sweating as best I can. We also have, if you see this arrow right down here, I'm going to talk about this here in a little bit, but there's an arrow pointing to a damper where that bypass is tied into the return. And I'll, again, I'll talk about that here in a second. And now that's the cooling side of it. Heat pumps. The biggest problem we get on a heat pump is we'll have homeowners that say it, it doesn't blow warm enough air. It blows cold air drafty inside of a house. Well, they're used to a gas furnace, which is cranking anywhere between 125 up to 145 degree heat into a home. They're used to that kind of heat. Now they put a heat pump in. Well, heck, it's sitting anywhere around 90 to 92 degrees. Well, let's take a look at what I do with a heat pump. I now take hot air, not needed, bracket, bring it back through the return, back across the coil, raising the coil temperature, raising my supply temperature. I've seen a heat pump deliver 115 degrees out of a grill in first stage and not run high head. And again, our supply air sensor mounted in the supply plant. I'm constantly looking at that supply, making sure that I'm not going off on high head pressure or hurting our heat exchanges. And on the heating side of it, that potentiometer goes from 110 all the way up to 217 degrees, taking care of any heat pump situation or gas furnace situation out there. Ack Emanuel Z, Jason uh, mentioned it in his opening, and we are firm believers in the Ack Emanuel Z. It gives us a guideline for installing zoning a proper way. And as far as I know, EWC, we were the only ones out there uh, really promoting the ACA Manual Z. So we're gonna go through it. Old school bypass duct design. Uh, each and every one of y'all have ran into this situation, even installed it, and I'll agree, I've even installed them this way. We have our bypass duct coming off of the supply plenum and then hanging over the top of the unit, we'll mount our bypass and then bringing it back into the return plenum. And if you're lucky enough to have a four foot return plenum, heck, we thought we were in high cotton there. And then our return duct is going into the back of the unit. Well, this situation we've, we've discovered has been part of our problem since the variable speed blower has came out. If we looked at, again, the variable speed blower, how it deals with that back pressure or resistance against the blower wheel, if I had all zones calling, theoretically, this bypass damper is closed. Well, with it sitting closed, we now have stagnant air halfway up this bypass duct. So guess what happens on this bypass duct? we start to gather a little moisture going on because that cold air is just sitting there. It's not traveling, it's stagnant. So that was the first situation that we came across. Then what we had where I would take phone calls, David, I need extra, if you all remember the arm and weight bypass, I need extra weights. Well, everybody thought the heck, the, the bypass I couldn't set it properly. So they, they would add extra weights on here and heck, I've seen boxes of washers, transformers, vice grips, coat hangers, anything to try and tie the, that metal arm from actually swinging all the way open. Well, uh, the situation was not necessarily that the bypass was bad, sized wrong, designed wrong. The problem was that particular duct layout with a variable speed. Again, if I had all zones calling, theoretically the bypass damper is closed. Once a zone is satisfied, that zone damper starts to go closed. What does the bypass damper do? Well, static in the duct builds, so now it pushes this bypass damper open. This bypass duct is a double static. We have a supply push and a return pull. Well, with it being a double static, as soon as this bypass damper opened up, what did the static, what happened to the static in the supply plenum? Well, it, it drops. So as it drops, what did our variable speed blower do? 
it starts to speed up. So as it speeds up, our bypass damper says, hey, I've got more air, I need to open up more. So it opens up more. Then the variable speed ramps up more. Bypass opens up more. They sat there and fought each other until this variable speed couldn't push any more air, it's just screaming. That was part of the situation, now let's add to it. This air is flying through the bypass duct, flying through the return plenum, bouncing on the bottom of the return, and then going through the unit. Well, as it flies across the back of the spot, or I'm sorry, as it flies across the back of the return plenum, what did I now create right here? This return air is trying to get in here. This bypass air says, no, you're not. I'm throwing an air curtain inside this plenum. Well, now that there's an air curtain here, I can't get return air. The unit is starving for air. Where does it make its air up from? The bypass duct. So now we just have a ton of air flying through this bypass going around and around in circles. Now there was a situation, if you remember, uh, I'd take phone calls. David, I actually have uh, water dripping off the coil and flying into the, the supply duct. Here's your reason why. We had no static on the air handler anymore. This bypass air is flying through. There's no static to bring the water down into the drain. So the ACA Manual Z addresses this, and that actual engineer, which by the way, it's kind of an interesting thought that ACA hired an engineer from outside the air conditioning industry. They hired a mathematician to uh, go through this zoning scenario. And the guy asked for our design, uh, all the zoning manufacturers, what are your theories and design thoughts on zoning? Well, <laughs> one of the situations that we did on a design was rather than bringing the bypass back to the return, I would promote going to a mixing box have that bypass into the mixing box, have the remote returns into their mixing box, let it pressurize mix there before coming back in through the air handler. And that gives us a better mix of bypass and return air. Well, this mathematician said, yeah, kind of theoretically, yeah, that's what you were doing. However, what you actually did was you added static to the bypass. And that, my friends, is what we're going to do with our bypasses now. So if I have anybody that runs into an arm and weight bypass out there, we need to change how our bypass duct is installed. Instead of having that bypass sitting in the middle of our bypass duct, we are now going to mount it on the supply plenum. Uh, I want that bypass when it's in the closed position to make sure that all the air remains in the supply plenum traveling down the ducts. The only time that I want air in this bypass duct is when it's necessary. So as the bypass goes through return, now we go over here, we have a manual damper collar installed. This manual damper collar is what is going to give us our static as the bypass air travels through the bypass duct, it hits this stationary uh, damper, sending static back through the bypass duct back to the air handler, making sure that our variable speed blowers don't hunt. They maintain a constant speed. I also promote in my training classes, we take our return plenums and we want them to be tied in front of the bypass duct. So now it has no ability to become an air curtain on the system. Now, do uh, Every one of our attics have a four foot, five foot, six foot plenum? No. Uh, so again, we're going back to a two foot, three foot, four foot plenum. And I, again, try and get those return ducts closer to the unit and the bypass duct tied as far away. Opposite on the supply plenum, I want the bypass damper to be the first damper installed in front of all the supply zone dampers. Now, this new bypass duct, if I'm looking at that hand damper, uh, we need to balance it. So on the ACA Manual ZR, it goes through our balancing instructions. We have our dual port manometer. I'm going to have all zones calling. 
I'll have my bypass damper completely closed. I'll have that hand damper completely closed. And I do build a hand damper. It's a beautiful hand damper. However, the majority of times, I'll just say I recommend just use your start collar and buy a damper, uh, a, a hand damper installed in the start collar. So I have the unit running up in high speed. I have my dual port manometer. It's giving me my external static pressure. That external static pressure, I'm going to write it down, put it on a, in the memory, put it in my phone, because I'm going to use that external static pressure to balance the bypass duct. Once I have the external static pressure, I now have only the smallest zone open, have my other two zone dampers closed, I have my bypass completely opened up. I want to take it out of play. All I'm doing is balancing this duct. Then I, excuse me, coffee's coming up on me. I go to the hand damper and I slowly start to open it up. As I slowly open it up, I'm watching my manometer. As soon as I hit that 0.52, that's the exact same 0.52 that I had with all zones calling and the bypass damper closed. I have now balanced this bypass duct. This variable speed blower has no idea that there's even zoning going on in this system. It maintains a constant static, which is what manufacturers like it to be. When most manufacturers like to see that 0.5 static. Now, EWC looked at this and said, uh, we asked ourselves a few questions. One, how many guys out in the field have a, du a dual port manometer? We figured at that moment, we've knocked out about 50% of the techs across the United States. And then as we uh, asked that question, we said, how many people have uh, charged batteries in their dual port manometer? We figured we'd just checked off another 50% of the 50% that we had. So we decided to go in with Belimo and design a bypass damper that takes those steps out of the contractor's hands. We have built what we call a smart bypass damper. This smart bypass damper is a Belimo actuator on there. And if you notice on the side, we actually have two ports. We have one port labeled positive, that pitot tube goes to the supply plenum, and one port labeled negative, that pitot tube goes to the return plenum. This bypass damper is 24 volts, can be tied into anybody's zone system. All I need is 24 volts to it. There's two LEDs on the front. You have your power LED that'll light up, and we have our bypass setup LED that will be blinking. It's letting the dealer know that, hey, I'm ready to be set. Now all the guy has to do is have his unit, all zones calling. He can go to each of the dampers, see the green LEDs. All right, I know those are the open position. If it's a multi-stage piece of equipment, make sure that that unit's ramped up into high speed. Then he takes his thermostat screwdriver or a pin and he presses this bypass setup button. It is actually a button. He presses it. This damper now goes into an automatic setup mode. The bypass setup LED stays constant. The bypass damper drives itself to the fully closed position. It'll sit there and measure the static across his equipment while it's in the closed position. In other words, I'm gathering the external static pressure as if there's no zoning going on in the system. Then the bypass damper drives itself to the open position. It measures, sits there for 10 seconds, again, measuring the static across the equipment. The bypass damper now knows the range at which it can play in. This bypass setup LED, it now goes out. It is set up. That's all he had to do was press a button. This damper now does not care whether the unit is in heating, cooling, low speed, high speed, uh, fan only, any zoning configuration that's going on within the home, it doesn't care. All it's caring about is making sure that the static across the equipment is maintained. That balancing damper, that start collar with the damper in it, 
it is no longer necessary with this bypass damper because what we have done is we've given this blade two baffles. They are an actual engineered size and curve on there to where we get a pressure drop across this bypass damper, making sure that we maintain a constant static back to the air handle. Now I will say if you're out in California, California has their wonderful Title 24 and you still need the hand balancing damper out there. If you have questions on that one, by all means, write it down. Write them down, write them down, ask them at the end. Everybody's bypass sizing rule. This is, uh, we've been doing it for the 30 years that I've been in the zoning industry. We've always taken our total capacity CFM, which our example that we had in the beginning was 1200 CFM. We subtract our smallest zone and this gives us our bypass CFM. Well, that was fine, but we had guys out in the industry that, uh, let's say you had a five ton single stage piece of equipment that blew nominal 2000 CFM and I've got a bonus room of 200 CFM. Well, they would come up with a bypass of 1800 CFM. They had put in a 16 inch bypass delivering 1800 CFM back into the return and causing all kinds of problems with equipment. So now uh, the ACA manual ZR has limited the amount of CFM going back into the return. But this was everybody's design and I'll still say that there are a lot of zoning manufacturers out there that'll still do this exact same exercise. Total capacity CFM, subtract the small zone, get the bypass CFM. They go to the bypass CFM chart and they look where does 750 CFM fall? Well, 10 inches, 700, but the 12 inch will actually handle the 750 CFM. It'll also handle up to 1100 CFM. So now as these variable speeds, and if it was an arm and weight situation, and thank goodness for those arm and weight bypasses, they are a thing of the past. Everybody has gone to a mechanical uh, dial to where you're setting a particular static on a bypass, or we've taken it to the nth degree and actually designed the static around what the contractor, his design was. If I was doing that situation, rather than doing the 1100 CFM bypass, me personally, I'm going to put in the 10 inch bypass and I'm going to go to one of the other zones, preferably the largest living area zone, and I'm going to set that damper to where it doesn't close all the way and I will take pressure off the bypass, bleed air into that particular zone. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. This is EWC's bypass. Now, we have experienced situations, and I'm sure you all have as well. You've got ducts that are sweating. We have cabinets that are sweating. We're basically making it rain in these people's uh, ceilings. So we have limited the size of our zones. If I had a single stage piece of equipment, my calculation, that I do while I'm training guys is I'm going to have the smallest zone is going to be the total capacity CFM times 0.35. That is my smallest zone. So I would take in our application 1200 CFM and it's very important nowadays uh, as well as it was in the past but even more now for the fact that we can say a three ton unit in the past, it blew a nominal 1200 CFM. But heck, our three ton units now are blowing anywhere from 1,050 up to 1200 CFM. So we get that number, we multiply by the 0.35 and it gives us 420. So the smallest zone I would like to see on a three ton piece of equipment is going to be 420. Now I have to do a calculation for my maximum bypass. What we will do is take our total capacity CFM and multiply by 0.5. So if I have 1200 CFM times 0.5, my maximum size bypass I'm ever going to install on a three ton piece of equipment is 600. Well, my smallest zone 
420, my bypass 600, I'm going to subtract 600 from the 420 and now get 180. So I will take 180 CFM and I will bleed it into a zone not calling. I'll also have guys while I'm doing a training class here and say, David, I zone out. Again, excuse me, guys, coffee's coming up on me. I'll have guys that three zone system. I've got a three ton house. I am definitely zoning out the master bedroom. And I agree wholeheartedly. If you have a homeowner, they spend one third of their life inside their master bedroom. So I will zone out the master bedroom. I zone out the living area and zone out the other bedrooms as one zone. So a three zone system, there is no way I have a master bedroom that's going to be 420 CFM. I, I let them know, guys, here's the situation. My back, my back, my maximum bypass of 600. I can work with that. Let's say the uh, smallest zone now, that master bedroom is, is 300 CFM. Okay, well, I'll, I know that my maximum bypass is 600. My zone is 300. I now have 300 CFM that I have to bleed into the other zones. Uh, all we're doing here is basically taking our single stage piece of equipment and operating it like a, uh, a communicating piece of equipment. If I looked at like the carrier infinity system, the train system, uh, Ream and Rude's uh, system, what, those, what that equipment will do is take a look at the CFM that that blower, the lowest it will go to, let's say is 420 CFM on a communicating piece of equipment, but that particular zone is 300 CFM. Well, it now takes that 180 uh, or CFM and it will blow it into zones that are not actually calling. It'll open up a carrier damper, whatever, halfway and blow it in there, a train damper halfway and blow it in there, a ream. All of those communicating systems, that's how they eliminate the bypass. Well, in our situation here, a perfectly designed, sized, and set up bypass, we saw that will increase the efficiency of every air conditioning out there, dehumidify better than anything, deliver air better than anything, and now when I'm using this factor, I'm gonna make sure that I'm not. I'm doing everything I can to not have that duct sweat. Again, if you have questions on this, this math, by all means, uh, bring them up at the end or email me, text me, call me, whatever you want to do. Now, multi-stage piece of equipment. This is, again, multi-stage and zoning is the best situation someone can put inside their home. On a multi-stage piece of equipment, our smallest zone, we like to take our total capacity CFM, multiply by 0.25. This gives us our smallest zone capability. Our minimum bypass, notice it's now minimum instead of max because I have two blower scenarios that I need to take care of. First stage capacity CFM times 0.5. So if our total CFM was 1200, most equipment that's two stage sits at around 67 or 70% low speed, gives us about 804 CFM. Now I multiply it by 0.5, gives me 402 CFM. Now I look at the 402 compared to my smallest zone. Okay, now I only have to bleed 102 CFM into the zones not calling. And if my bypass is 402 CFM, heck, I go to our bypass chart, and it's beautiful. I can now install a nice small eight inch rather than these 12, 14, 16 inch bypasses that people are putting on that once again, that bypass duct is the path of least resistance. I don't want a lot, a big duct to where that unit can not only push but pull that air in causing the cabinet and all the duct to sweat. My other calculation that I use on a multi-stage piece of equipment is going to, let's go to an example of a three zone system. I need to add my smallest two zones. And the reason I say the smallest two zones because our panels 
we have a situation where I can inhibit high speed from coming on unless 50% of the zones are calling. So with one zone calling, I'll never allow that piece of equipment to go up into high speed. The only way I'm going to allow it into high speed is if two zones are calling. So I add up my two smallest zones, and this gives me my high speed bypass CFM. So my total capacity CFM times 0.5 must be less than or equal to my high speed bypass. And again, when I'm doing a training class, and the majority of my training classes will last anywhere between two and a half to four hours, I sit there and I'll go through multiplications to make sure that guys understand uh, what their CFM, what it's doing, and we'll even look up. I'll whatever if a trained guy is in there and say, hey, let's look at a, a trained air handler. Let's look at a two-speed. Let's look at the CFM. Let's design it right here. And we'll go through it in my training classes. But with an hour uh, with you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to throw the math out there. If you want to get a hold of me, we can go through it uh, over the internet or after the class. And now I can look at my bypass CFM. And in that particular application, I came up with a 10 inch for 700 CFM. And in fact, I didn't. I think what I was going through in my head was basically saying, let's say my two smallest zones are the exact same size. They're both 300 CFM zones. So now I've added it up, it's 600 CFM. So my total capacity CFM, which was 1200 times 0 0.5 is 600 CFM. It must be less than or equal to, well, it's equal to it. So I'm okay with that CFM number of being 600. And I go to my chart and I realize that my 10 inch bypass will handle that 600 CFM. Advantages of bypassing into the return. There are a few of them. The biggest one is maximize the efficiency of the BT is produced. Uh, we have guys that do what was known as dump zones, that they will take the bypass duct and they put it into a non-critical area such as a hallway or mechanical room in a, in a commercial application. Well, we would like them to go right back into the return. And again, as long as it's sized and set up properly, it gives us an advantage. In fact, if I looked at now, that supply air temperature, instead of it being a regular 55 degrees, I'm now down at uh, 47, 48, 49, and again, depending on where we are in the state of Texas, if I'm out in, let's say, Abilene, San Angelo, West Texas, shoot, I've got dry air, I can drop that supply temperature down at 45 degrees. Well, that 45 degree compared to a normal 55 degree, gives me extra latent cooling capacity as well as increase the efficiency of the equipment. Advantageous discharge temperature. Hey, that's simple. Warmer in heating, cooler in cooling. Shorter run times. Now the homeowner recognizes, hey, we don't have to run that equipment that long. Now, do I want to uh, short cycle the equipment? Heck no. Uh, you know it and I know it, that every time that compressor starts, that's exactly when the energy is drawn and that makes a piece of equipment less efficient. So by it being properly sized and set up, it gives us the necessary runtime to remove the moisture and not short cycle. Unloading the compressor. This was huge. Uh, back. Gosh, I, I bet it was 20 years ago, we had Alabama Power. Uh, wasn't really a, a study with Alabama Power, but uh, it came out to a job site and we had a heat pump operating. And without it being in bypass, it was drawn, it was a five ton unit without bypass or without the bypass open, I should say. We were drawing a standard of 26 amps. All right, beautiful. Well, we put it into a 50% bypass. We reduced the amp draw to 17. So we just made a five ton 10 sear heat pump work more efficient than a five ton 14. So I have no problem when guys tell me that they don't think zoning is efficient on a piece of equipment. 
Now, there's a lot of guys, you know what, I can't change your mind. You can think what you want, but I've seen it in action. And until you see one sized and set up properly, uh, it is wonderful what a bypass will do on a system. Another thing it will do, consistent airflow through the equipment. Again, I'm not putting back pressure on the equipment. I do not have a free flowing bypass to where now the variable speed blower runs away. Uh, this design keeps the airflow consistent on a variable speed, making sure that it doesn't hunt. I can also, uh, I don't know if you all are familiar with the state of California, but about, uh, let's go with six years ago, they were actually had it in the California Energy Commission, they were voting to outlaw bypasses. Well, EWC, and when I say EWC, it was EWC's owner and our chief engineer, they went out to California and blocked it. They said, you cannot block a bypass. And they go, well, it hurts equipment. And they said, well, yes, it will, unless it's sized and set up properly. So California allowed EWC to prove that a bypass sized and set up properly will help a piece of equipment. We did two houses in the Sacramento area. Uh, both of them had zoning uh, already installed. They were very similar houses. One of them we left alone. The other one, we ripped that zone system out, designed it to EWC specs, and then went to the California Energy Commission's uh, engineer of choice and used his instruments, brought them to both job sites. We proved on the job site that we, uh, our install to EWC's specs, increased the efficiency of the equipment. The study is out there. We ended up selling it to, I believe it was AHRI, and they've actually had it published. If you would like that article, um, I can also send that to you. Just drop me a note and uh, I'll, I'll send it over to you, or Jason, I can send it over to you and you can send it out to the masses. That'd be great. You bet. And the final thing with the, with the bypass is unparalleled dehumidification. Uh, again, there is nothing that uh, will dehumidify a system better than what a bypass will. That concludes the bypass portion. Uh, as far as our product offering, I'm, I'm not going through the panels. I'm just throwing this out here. We do have a fresh air economizer panel. Anybody that's been around the Fort Worth, Dallas area, uh, our, we are putting these on a lot of systems. Our codes have changed. Uh, if they're using anything from 2011 and greater, anything three tons and above, or I believe it's 30,000 BTU and above, on a commercial application has to have an economizer on there. Package units are fine. You can put an economizer on a package, use the one that's on the piece of equipment or buy the one that goes into that package unit. Split systems are where the problem comes in. This is now a perfect by or bypass, <laughs> a perfect economizer for a split system. It uses four ways of bringing in fresh air, time, dry bulb, return air, as well as an enthalpy controller. And to meet code, you use the enthalpy controller on this particular panel. We have three regular 24 volt zone systems, our good, better, and best. Uh, our UZC four panel, four stage heat, two stage cool, to high end residential up to a really nice light commercial panel with capability of uh, tying into a uh, fire alarm system. It has the ability to bring in fresh air via a CO2 sensor. We use it on a lot of uh, nurseries type of thing. Uh, we also, how I talked about our communicating zone systems that we build, our UT3000, uh, which is for the Daikin equipment. And then we also have our Econet 3, which goes on the Ream and Root communicating equipment. Now, again, I brought this slide up in the beginning and I love closing with it as well. If, if we looked at the future of the air conditioning industry, do we really believe that the future is one thermostat in the middle of a house? Uh, but I, you know it and I know it, no way, multiple thermostats. Uh, gentlemen, you can visit our website. It does have 
a lot of tech bulletins on there, really good information for both the homeowner as well as a contractor. And if you notice, we do have a QR code on here. Uh, if you have a QR reader, uh, we actually have an app now that it's both on the Android store as well as your iPhone store. Uh, this app has the our bypass calculator. It has our products on there. You can design a system. You can get our tech bulletins right from that app as well. And then, uh, guys, I again, I thank you, Jason, very much uh, this morning for bringing me in. If you guys have any questions, by all means, we can answer them now. And, and I also have my email and my cell phone up there, and you can contact me after we leave here. Fantastic, David. Re really well done. I, I wish I wish I had spent a little time in the HVAC industry. I, I grew up framing houses, but I, that's one one industry I've never really spent any time up in. Um, I, I think the, you know, do we really want to make the hallway the most comfortable room kind of goes a long way into, I deal with builders all the time and, you know, it's like, yeah, we, we can still build houses that, you know, keep the weather out and people in, but don't we want to get a little bit better? Um, and so, you know, just trying to get people to do it a little bit better. I really um, appreciated the, you know, we do have a lot of code officials on the call. Uh, okay. And so, you know, some just general you know, if, if you're a code official and you have 35 inspections and, and you know, you you don't have time to verify that they've balanced and their static is correct and everything else, just some some general guidelines and rules of thumb. You know, if you do see a bypass uh, duct on a system, you know, uh, making sure you're not creating that air curtain that you mentioned, you know, and, and where the the damper installation location being as close to the uh, the supply plenum rather than in the middle of the damper and just some of those general rules of thumb I thought were great. Do have a few questions or one question it seems like we always get a few more afterwards so I'm sure you'll probably get a few more to your email but how do you know your damper and set screw do not have a discrepancy in position? On the uh, great question, <laughs> I didn't bring it up. On the shaft itself, on that zone damper, there's two protrusions on the shaft that always face the way the blade faces. Mm -hmm. And so, by setting the set screw, you see the blade position in relative to which way the duct is going. So you know that. All right, I'm at a uh, let's say a let's just go with 90 degrees is straight up and down. If I see my blade at 75 degrees, okay, now I know that, that I'm bleeding. Uh, shoot, if I, I'd have to look at our linear curve on that damper, but I believe at 75% closed, I'm bleeding about 10% of air through that duct. Okay, all right. Well, that's, uh, hopefully, I, I might uh, try to pull together uh, just a, a short list of just some guidance for code officials when they do see uh, a bypass uh, duct, just some, some things to look at. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I, ideally everything's done 100% per the ACA manuals, but the reality of it is in a lot of jurisdictions, people are kind of winging it a little bit and using some rules of thumb. So if you I bet. could come up with some just general guidance for a non by the book install, uh, it would be helpful for the code officials. And as far as I know, uh, the ACA Manual Z is not necessarily, it's nor around its code. Um, I believe in the book, it does leave quite a bit to interpretation and I could potentially that is the reason why. But I could also look like uh, the ACA Manual J, how we're doing our load calcs, and well, heck, I can take a house and I can turn it instead of it facing west, I have it facing north, and I get a total different uh, uh, number using it that way. But uh, anything that I can do, Jason, to uh, help you guys out, shoot, just ask me. I'm, I'm here awesome. for you. Awesome. Really enjoyed it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, really appreciate y'all hopping on. 
Uh, we'll send out a course evaluation and a PDF of the PowerPoint. And David, really appreciate it. I, uh, I'm going to have to watch this video again once we put it on our YouTube channel because a little, quite a bit of it was a little bit over my head. I, I think one more time through, I'll really have a lot better handle on it. I really appreciate you joining us this morning. And with that, we're a few minutes over, so we're going to go ahead and cut it. You see David's contact information. Of course, always reach out to me as well. I'm happy to help you guys out any way that I can. So thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks again, David. And we'll talk to you here in another month with another webinar. Thanks so much.